You're listening to The Weather Junkies. Oh, boy. Large wedge tornado coming up in A winter storm warning is in effect for our area. So we can expect at least another two to four inches for the night. Then that snow is The National Weather Service in Huntsville has issued a tornado warning for Northwestern Madison. 14 to 22 inches of snow! Good Thursday Thursday. evening. Thank you for joining in. We have a special episode on this Thursday, March 23rd, also a special time. We are joined by the hosts of the Weather Hype podcast, Min and Castle. Welcome to the show. As always, uh, I'm Tyler Jankowski, currently joining the show from Plattsburgh, New York, and Dakota is in Colorado. Dakota? Hey, everybody, and hey, Tyler. Thanks for listening. I feel like a broken record. It's another gorgeous day in Colorado. Sunny skies, 75 degrees. Uh, Only problem is that it's dry still. Uh, For now, we're supposed to get, um, we are going to get some precipitation tomorrow. Overnight tonight, there's a storm, low pressure system tracking um, south of us and is also partly responsible for some of the severe weather going on today. Uh, That's Thursday in the Great Plains. So, uh, yeah, interesting weather right now across the Rockies and the Great Plains. Some snow, some severe weather, some rain, a little bit of everything. Tyler, how is the weather up in New York? Uh, It's been really cold the last two days. We almost set some record lows. We did not this time around, but um, the trade-off going forward is that it warms up and we have like six straight days of clouds, rain, and snow showers. So that's what we're looking forward to starting tomorrow or not looking forward to. So uh, not not a whole lot to look forward to in the next seven days. But um, I, I haven't been on the show in a while and we got a big storm. I don't know if you heard. Um, no, I hadn't heard about it actually. Uh, we actually had officially over 30 inches of snow in Burlington where the official measurement is taken and and is the second largest storm on record and I talked to one of our one of our other meteorologists who's been around forever and he said that the largest storm on record was a freak upslope event in Burlington and literally everyone else got almost nothing so he was saying in Plattsburgh, it was probably the biggest storm in the last 100 years, at least. Is there an official station there or no? No. Gotcha. Huh. That's crazy. Wow, yeah. What a, what a time to join that crew over there. Yeah. I, I mean, I stood out in it for a couple of hours and it was truly a blizzard. I think they officially classified it as a blizzard here. Some of the data was spotty, but it's so tough for the automated instruments to actually measure that type of stuff. A lot of times they break down and... I guess there was ice, there was like rogue wind gusts that weren't even real. So it's it's tough, but I stood out in it. It was definitely a blizzard. You couldn't see anywhere. The snow came down. It, some places had like four and five inch per hour snowfall rates wow. in, in New England, in the Northeast. And um, it's crazy. I mean, a lot of times you have to wait a while to put these types of things in perspective. And I think when we look back on it, it'll definitely stand out and... Certainly, I mean, it, Scranton threw up here was was the bullseye. It was I know I guess people got screwed along the coast, but <laughs> but I didn't mind. I mean, we had a lot of wiggle room, and uh, we never went over to sleep here. So yeah, that's awesome. I'm I'm jealous. I'm ready for this snow to melt. How much is still on the ground? It looks like about a foot. Wow. Um, we haven't really had a big warm spell, but the March sun. It's really been the March sun. <laughs> that's just decreased the snow. It's not like we've had rain or really warm stuff, but yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so as Tyler said, we're joined tonight by Min and Castle of Weather Hype. Um, intro here before having them come on the show. Uh, Min's currently a second year master's student in the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment at East Carolina University. He has a bachelor's of science uh, in geography from the University of Georgia. And Castle is a first-year PhD student in the Department of Geography at the University of Georgia. And uh, I don't know, what what do they call it? 
like a three three peat if you get all the same degrees in the same place. <laughs> I but, call uh, it a thoroughbred. He, a thorough, thoroughbred. <laughs> uh, so sorry, he's he's got a bachelor of science and master's in geography from University of Georgia, and a bachelor of science in psychology from the University of Georgia. So um, well educated, I should say. And uh, yeah, they're from Weatherhype. So Min and Castle, welcome to the show. Hey guys, what's going on? Hey, thanks for having us. <laughs> Oh yeah, glad to do it. Um, so we're still in weather in our backyard. Uh, man, I'll start with you. You're both in the southeast. Uh, how's the weather down there? Uh, we were close to 80 yesterday, and then the temperatures dropped after the front went through, so now we're down the 50s, but uh, pretty comfortable. Temperatures are probably dropping to around freezing tonight, and uh, sunny skies, so not too bad. A little bit more seasonable than what we've been used to. Um, be warmer for the summertime, 80 pretty consistently, but um, as a guy that likes cool weather, I'm very happy to see the cool weather now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Castle, I'm assuming it's kind of similar for you. Yeah, it's um, it was about mid 60s today, but it kind of got cloudy towards the end of the day, which was really nice. Um, it was a bit chilly this morning though. The <laughs> wind was a bit rough um as well, but we had some crazy severe weather like two days ago. A nice hailstorm and everything here in Athens. So. It was. It's been crazy this week. That's for sure. Yeah, that time of year looks like there's going to be a few more bouts of severe weather during the week, or maybe over the weekend and next yeah, week. Weekend, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tonight we're talking about social sciences. Uh, that's that's uh, your your guys' specialty. Uh, so we're <laughs> going to dive into that after talking about trending in the weatherverse. Uh, and to start off uh, the segment this week, some sad news to pass along here. Um, this tweet comes from the AMS official account, AMETSOCH. Um, you can follow them on Twitter there. Uh, their tweet says, AMS mourns the loss of our president, Matthew J. Parker. Our thoughts and prayers go out to his family and friends. Uh, pretty unexpected and, uh, and tragic news here. I had the pleasure just to uh, recently meet Matt, and super sociable guy, uh, very nice. Uh, just, you know, I, I was some nobody at a, um, I guess it was like a, a bar or something where they were having a, a meetup and he just came up to me and we started talking and uh, it was really great. So um, really, really sad thing here. And uh, yeah, we're thinking about him and his family at this time. Um, Min and Castle, did you guys end up meeting him this year or, or, or before in AMS? Yeah, we um, had a chance to meet him at the summer community meeting for AMS, I believe, mm -hmm. two years ago, right, Castle, in 2015? Yes. Yeah, and that was in Raleigh, and um, he was, I don't think he was elected yet. It was between him and somebody else, and they were both running for uh, mm -hmm. to be president of AMS, but uh, nothing but excitement from him. He was very a genuine guy to other people, um, so it's really sad to see um, him pass away. But um, like a lot of us say, you know, he was going to be the president of AMS for the Austin meeting in 2018, and so I think a, a good tribute for, for him is to uphold the legacy of Mm -hmm. uh, reaching out and, and bridging the gap between different communities in the weather uh, enterprise and just making sure that we do all that we can to um, inspire other people like he's inspired so many. Yeah, I actually got to meet him or see him again at in Seattle. He came to one of our committee meetings um, that I was in and he was so excited for the communication aspect of the upcoming meeting. He was asking our ideas and just really getting us all pumped about it, which was so awesome. And I actually spoke with him about two or three weeks before his passing, and we were just brainstorming ideas for the meeting. And so it was just such a tragic loss. Like, it's just, it's so strange. But I'm glad that AMS is doing some excellent things by putting together uh, travel funds in his, in his honor and his name. I think that's the best way that we can honor him is by bringing those people, like men said, that may not be able to or may not know about the community, bringing them to these meetings and getting them involved so that we're all talking and uh, being under one roof together. Yeah, you know, you mentioned that he, you talked to him just recently and you were brainstorming with him. I I sent him an email not expecting to get a response. And I was just, you know, asking him about something about AMS and like how I could help. And he responded the same day with like, yeah, sure, let's let's get this going. So I think just, just that just goes to show you how much he was... Um, how personable he was and how much he wanted to 
you know, be involved in, in every part of AMS, uh, whether whichever uh, aspect of it was, whether you're a student, whether you're uh, faculty or in academia, or whether you're in communications or forecasting, he knew AMS kind of embodied everything. Um, mm -hmm. And he, you know, wanted to bring everything together. Um, yeah, I never got to meet him, but he actually favorited my tweets when I tweeted that I got the CVM. I thought, wow, how cool is that? Who is this? <laughs> oh, he's the president of the AMS. <laughs> uh, that was the only interaction I ever had with him. And uh, just something as little as a tweet favorite changes your impression uh, when you're talking about someone in that position. And um, certainly everything you guys have said you know, sort of falls in the same line that he was really interested in in everything and bringing people together and in, in the communication. So a tough loss, and he had barely just gotten started. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be thinking about Matt, his family, uh, honestly, over the next year, and then especially in Austin uh, in at the next AMS uh, annual meeting. Uh, let's move on here to our next tweet from... Sean Milrad, you can follow him on Twitter at Sean Milrad. Um, his tweet says, ha, 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 <laughs> oh my God, I can't <laughs> breathe, ha, 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 ha. Uh, he's, he has a picture here of, it looks like a, a news article from Canada talking about a uh, snowstorm. And this, the, the article says, the snowstorm caused five deaths, stranded hundreds of motors overnight, shut, shut down schools and universities. Um, and the article asks, was this week storm a record breaker? And, uh, and the, the article says, hard to say according to Environment Canada. It's a rare storm, but I can't say if it broke a record. It was definitely an exceptional storm, uh, said a meteorologist at the Montreal Weather Office. And uh, <laughs> this, this cracked me up a little bit uh, because we, we give the National Weather Service such a hard time uh, over busts, which, you know, I, in some cases it's granted, in some cases it's not, or, um, not granted. In some cases it's, it's warranted, in some cases it's not. Uh, but it goes to show you how good our National Weather Service is, because if they had a question like this, uh, they would have a much better answer, uh, for the, the journalist here. Well, I have, uh, you know, a little bit of firsthand experience with, uh, just to our north. Um, I haven't been here during the summer, certainly not as a meteorologist, but I, I was interested in how they do things up there. I actually visited the weather service in Burlington and I asked them, I said, how often do you guys call the people to the north or, or do they have weather service offices? And they said, mm, not really. They said, they said they have a good relationship with the people in I believe it's Toronto or somewhere a little bit more directly to the west as opposed to the north. They said that was primarily because that's where the weather comes from. But the thing that they highlighted that struck me as odd is they, I don't know how much you guys know about it, but they do, they cover the weather totally differently up there. They, they don't issue like storm-based tornado warnings and they don't issue like storm-based severe thunderstorm warnings. Apparently they'll issue like, issue like a broad, like huge area that could see bad weather and they'll leave it in effect for like the whole day. And that's as good as it gets. Oh and, wow. And I guess the reason is they're, cover, they're literally covering the entire province or provinces. It, so there's far less people to cover a heck of a lot more land. Hmm. So they don't really get down and dirty like we do here with, with the specifics. That's interesting. And presumably they have less money too. They're, they're not as well funded. They probably have less money, but I did hear that they're getting a new radar network or something. Oh yeah. They're getting dual poles, I think. But yeah, it's much different. It's much different. Hmm. So it doesn't surprise me that he didn't have the record available. I almost wonder if it's like the journalist aspect of this that maybe we're not thinking about. Cause I don't even know why the storm being a record breaker is even like a question or a reason why we're asking like we see all the impacts that happened above the question so why isn't the article focusing around that that's the question I that have. is really weird yeah who cares if it's a record breaker if it well, did it all first because they just i was like why are they laughing because <laughs> a bunch of people died and then i like had to think about it more and you guys started collaborating i was like oh okay that makes more sense but i was like man like five people dying like and you know, hundreds stranded. Holy, like that sounds like a nightmare. Like, it's no damn thing that happened a few years ago. You know, that was rough. Yeah, yeah. Out of context, 
<laughs> Sean's tweet is really <clears throat> looks really <laughs> bad. <laughs> but I, I don't know. I guess if you'd, you'd have to be well versed in like the weather Twitter verse and stuff to really understand like what he's saying. But but yeah, at first glance, it's like why? Yeah, why are you laughing at that? <laughs> um, so Tyler, I'm gonna let you take uh, the next tweet here. I think you picked it. Yeah, the next tweet comes from the National Weather Service in Boston, and they actually tweeted it several days after the snowstorm, which I sort of appreciated because everything nowadays is instantaneous. So it seems to me like they, uh, you know, sort of put this out of the oven and let it simmer for a little while and figure out how they wanted to approach it. But basically the Weather Service in Boston tweeted, uh, Here's a statement from our meteorologist in charge about last week's winter storm in southern New England. It's on letterhead from the U.S. Department of Commerce, NOAA, NWS, and it's actually signed. And the letter basically says there have been, uh, you know, um, a few media references to the handling of last week's nor'easter. And, and, there, and I did hear it personally. There, there was something in the media that said the weather service was withholding information and when I heard that I was like where did that come from it's like it's like um, someone fed them like some wrong piece of information and they ran with it um, and so the weather service was forced to address this like very odd thing in the media but I was happy to see a tweet like this because too often we um, we don't have some sort of official voice on social media. And this was like, wow, they put their foot down and they actually said something official and they, they whipped us all in the shape. Um, so that was my reaction to this. Yeah, I, it's interesting. I, I feel like this is happening more and more. Uh, I can't remember. There was one instance uh, just... I think a month ago that I saw where, where a similar thing happened, a National Weather Service office came out and like essentially apologized or something. You know, it wasn't exactly like this, but um, but yeah, it is. I, I do like seeing kind of the more personal connection, uh, putting, putting out a letter addressing an issue that everyone's talking about. Um, Min, you wanted to talk about a tweet that is directly related to this. You want to uh, give us give us that tweet? Yeah, sure. Um, so I was looking on, you know, weather Twitter, and uh, I, I saw a tweet from Matt Lanza um, in direct response to that National Weather Service Boston statement. And it says, it reads, uh, this is really wild. Preach, appreciate this, but I sincerely hope this doesn't have to be done after every forecast miss. You know, um, we I like the idea of people being genuine, right? Like g going ahead and addressing the, the problems that we see and uh, not hiding away from it. Because if you don't address it, there is more possibility that people are gonna start talking about it. Um, but I do understand where Matt's coming from and saying like, do we always have to make a statement when things don't turn out the way people think it should have turned out? Really a forecast miss or a forecast bust. Like, you know, unless you weren't along the I-95 corridor, uh, anywhere west of the I-95, they pretty much got what they thought they were gonna get. Um, but I do like the idea of them putting out that statement and saying, you know, here's what happened on, on and then, um, having that addressed right away as opposed to letting people, um, you know, staying away from the media. Cause I think a lot of times, um, we try to not address the rumors or address the problems that we hear about in the news and in the media. Um, but I think sometimes it's important to talk about these things and get it out there because, you know, we need to stand up for our discipline and our, our field, but also um, make sure that people know what we're doing. And I think this is a little piece of education that's really necessary, in my opinion. I would agree. Um, that goes all to transparency. That's like the biggest, the big word of PR is being transparent about what's going on behind the scenes. And I think that's what this letter does. Plus, there's been research that shows like when you're dealing with false alarm and false alarm effect and false alarm perception, that when you provide your audience with some sort of statement detailing why things went wrong, it's more likely to reduce their false alarm perception so that they don't think that this was a false alarm and therefore it would impact future decisions that they would need to make. So I, I think that's a perfect segue uh, to start talking about social sciences. 
and uh, what you all do. Uh, I guess we already, <laughs> I guess we already kind of went there. But uh, I guess before we get into some of the nitty gritty, uh, I was hoping that you, uh, that Men in Castle, could could give us a little intro on on some of the research you do. And I'm going to test your communication skills here. Uh, can you, what? Can you, <laughs> can, you, can you can you do it in uh, let's let's say sixty seconds or less? Mm, Ooh, elevator this, speech. This is a really long elevator. <laughs> yeah, you don't really need to. Okay, fine. You want thirty? We'll do thirty seconds. <laughs> let's, let's do that. Thirty seconds or less. Okay, Castle, you or me first? Uh, you can go first. Okay. Um, so you know, as a meteorologist and uh, as a bachelor of science in meteorology and interested in social science, um, I think my area of interest is definitely communication and how to better communicate and effectively communicate weather information. So, um, which is looking at smartphones and mobile weather applications and understanding how to better communicate forecast information and then eventually things like severe weather information um, to the general public and people who are um, consuming that information because so many times you hear, oh, my phone app said this, but the weather turned out to be like that. You know, meteorologists are always wrong, blah, blah, blah. Um, trying to get at that point and understand and teach people and educate people how smartphones work and then also how do we better tailor what we're producing for people who are consuming the information. Cool. Boom. 40 seconds. So it's pretty good. Oh. You timed me for real? <laughs> I didn't time you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, okay, for me, I'm kind of in the same boat. I like uh, communication, looking at messages, but I'm also kind of crossed with psychology and looking at risk perception and that sort of thing. So right now in my PhD work, I'm kind of in the transitional period trying to figure out what I'm going to do, but it'll probably involve warning communication in some way. Um, but for my master's thesis, I looked at how do we communicate the risk of children being forgotten in hot cars to parents? What is the current way that we're doing it? How do they understand that risk? And how can we improve upon that in the future? Wow. 29.25. That, that, you don't get much better Boom. than that. Man, the price is right. <laughs> yeah. um, so why, why is social sciences so critical in weather forecasting? Oh, man. Well, here, I actually Googled the definition of social science to, just to see what would pop up. Yes. So this is the Gina way of doing things. Yeah. Bring it, bring it. <laughs> Gina Esco, shout out. Um, <laughs> the definition here says the scientific study of human society and social relationships. Do you do you, do you feel like that's a, a, a thing or is it maybe a little bit off on the def definition? Um, I feel like that's like as broad as you're going to get for social science. So I think that's good. Yeah. So then I guess if we were to kind of dissect social science and what it is, um, I think we talked about it a little bit before uh, we started taping, but um, a lot of people don't know what social science is. They think it's just like people and we throw it all together. But it's something that Castle and I both like to uh, address and break down a little bit further the different disciplines that can be involved in social science. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are, again, like Castle psychology. And then there's sociology, geography, which is what we're a part of. Also anthropology, which I never really thought about as much, but it's definitely relatable. And then things like economics, political science, those things all come together and can be intertwined with meteorology very effectively um, to do social science work. Um, so Castle, if you want to take, a, take away part of the reason why social science is important in meteorology, go for it. Yeah, sure. So when you think about weather forecasting, what what are we doing? Like it's for people. Um, people are involved with it. The end user is the most important aspect of weather forecasting. We're trying to provide this information for someone, a person to make a decision in their daily life that hopefully saves them or like protects their property in some way. That's like the mission statement. So I think it's important to consider social science because it's so human focused that it's it's crazy to think that it hasn't been a huge aspect up until this point. Yeah, well, so what changed? Why why did it become why did it find <laughs> someone's finally see the light and say, "Oh, crap, we got to, you know, fix this." You know, I think social science hasn't really been in the spotlight as much, but I I very uh, venture to say that people have been doing social science work in meteorology for quite some time for decades yes, even. Um, but it just hasn't really been popularized as much or in the public as much or even with meteorologists as much until recently. Um, I think a lot of big events are happening. 
Twitter, through social media, through other media outlets, things are really getting blown up really quickly and people know when things are happening. Um, would you have the same reaction if that same snowstorm that hit the Northeast happened 20 years ago? You know, now we have social media where anyone and everyone can spout their opinion, their belief, whatever. Um, again, in the news or whatever that we have right now, um, things can get out of hand very quickly. And so I think when we start seeing these problems, we start asking these questions, and then these questions lead to, oh, well, we should definitely engage in, you know, quote unquote, social sciences to try to figure out what to do next, what to do better on. Um, so I think it's it's been happening, but the push there is more, and there's more pressure to get that kind of social science work um, in meteorology, and, and the momentum is definitely shifting. And I think before, maybe a few years ago, we would have said, social science is important, we need to do it more. I think now we're starting to say more, social science is here, and it's not a, it's going to happen, it already is happening everywhere. Yes. Uh, so I've heard in casual conversation, uh, and I'm not going to name point, name any names or anything, but I've heard the argument that we're putting too much energy on communication and social science when it comes to forecasting, hmm. and the actual forecasting of the science behind forecast, the, the the physical science behind forecasting, is actually more important. We need to improve the accuracy of our models and and make the physics better in our models. Uh, I, I mean, I kind of have an idea of what you think of this, but I'm curious, what are your thoughts on on that kind of comment? Castle, you want to start off? Yeah, I was going to say, let me take it away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about it, like our forecasting technology is like super up to date. If we're going to be updating it, we're going to be tweaking small things that are going to have small changes on the forecasting of a, a weather event or a, something like that. But when you think about how it's being communicated, like this hasn't been touched on as much in previous literature and previous work and applications. So if we are devoting or like devoting our resources to weather forecasting, that's already kind of at the superior level and communication of that information is at this kind of middle range. It makes sense to kind of try and balance the scales a little bit. We want to make sure that this information that's being forecast is getting to the audience that it needs to get to. If it's this super awesome weather forecast that isn't reaching someone that needs to make a decision, then is it really being helpful at all? Yeah, and I add on to that too. Um, yeah, there's definitely things that we can do and more investments so we can make into weather forecasting. Our, the American model GFS is not the greatest thing in the world. Um, the Euro model is um, a little bit of a head with the um, simulation and, and all that technology. So we can definitely invest more in forecasting and the physical sciences. Um, but I think that's always going to be there. We're always going to try to improve. And I think now, impactful on the publics, uh, I think it's really important that we reach out with social science, right? Um, if, again, what Castle said, we can have the best forecast ever. I mean, nowadays, you know, we can look at pretty comfortably <clears throat> three days in advance and know that the mm -hmm. weather forecast is going to be pretty spot on unless you have some crazy weather situation where you can't really predict. But, you know, I can look at the temperature for what, like five to seven days and know that that's pretty spot on to what's going to happen. So I think that weather information is out there that maybe the way we're communicating it is most effective or other things as well. And I think a side tangent to this, because Castle knows how much I love my tangents. <laughs> um, before and even some now, a lot of products that we make in the weather enterprise and meteorology, we make them and then we throw them onto people and say, mm -hmm. here you go, we did this for you, now you have to consume it. As opposed to starting from the bottom and getting there to a point where we're asking the people what they want, what they need, and then we tailor what we're doing for them, as opposed to, hey, look at my creation I made. It is, <laughs> and then uh, now you have to figure it out for yourself. And then we have to educate people on how to use what we're doing, as opposed to they're the ones that are kind of starting from the bottom, telling us what they need, and then I think that's really important as well. So there's a, a group, <clears throat> a, a, to me it's a, a Facebook group, but I know it's much bigger than that, uh, called Was Is. And I actually am, I don't know the full acronym. I don't actually know what it stands for completely. Um, I know what the, the IS is, 
But I was wondering if you guys could talk about that <laughs> and, and the goal of it and, and how it started, because I know it's been around for a while now. And yeah, I guess what the, the overall goal of it is. You want to do that one, or do you want me to? <laughs> um, you can take it away if you want. Sure. Um, <laughs> I'm just scrolling through the Google Doc. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> hey, me too. Um, so what this stands for Weather and Society Integrated Studies. And it was a movement by um, Dr. Eve Grunfess, who was huge and instrumental in bringing Definitely. alive social science meteorology and really getting that dialogue going. So I believe in 2005, maybe, was that the first workshop that they had? I think that is around the correct time, yes. Okay, in the mid-2000s, they, they hosted workshops around uh, Boulder a few times in Colorado, and then they hosted some, I think, in Oklahoma, and one time it was like in Australia or New Zealand or something. Mm -hmm. And these workshops brought together like you know, 10, 20 social science-minded people to come together and develop ideas for how to proceed into pushing social science more in meteorology. And um, with budget cuts and things like that, um, it got really hard to fund these workshops. And so during the recession, things started getting kind of um, hairy. And so these workshops kind of dwindled away and, and never really um, started happening again. So afterwards, when Castle and I started getting more engrossed in this area of weather that we love so much, we thought, okay, well, you know, maybe we should revive some of this stuff because, you know, it's hard sometimes being in meteorology and not wanting to forecast or not wanting to do broadcasts or not wanting to do this or that. And again, there's nothing wrong with those at all. But when you're trying to find your way in meteorology, which is already a small field, interests like um, communication or psychology, it's hard to find your way. And it gets kind of frustrating sometimes. So Castle and I thought, well, let's make a little subset of what is of his students. That way, we can try to rally other students who are like us, who are interested in meteorology and social science. What we can do, see if we can start carrying that momentum again, where we've been doing. We started that up in 2014, I think, Castle? Yes, that's correct. OK. And so we've been trying to go to AMS meetings and say, OK, you know, we can't find you a job. That's not what we're doing. But what we are doing is trying to build our network so you can reach out to mentors in the field or professional faculty members at different schools who are doing this kind of social science work. And that way, you can have a mentor that can lead you and guide you as you're finding your own way, too. And then we can start building people who are thinking in this way. And I think, obviously, like with meteorology education now, it's not enough just to be a forecaster. You truly have to embrace other things as well. And I think that's a new trend that is going to be continuing on for a while. Great. Yeah. And if you want to check out that group, <clears throat> you can go to Facebook and you just search was, is. Uh, there's a little asterisk in between the WAS and the IS. Um, and you, so, so you two also have a podcast called Weather Hype. It's an awesome podcast. I love it. Uh, everyone else should love it as well and go listen. Um, I actually kind of feel like your spokesperson because I've been on a bunch of podcasts I know, recently. You are. And I, I, I don't know what I, I just like it so much. So I figured I would plug it um, if I had the chance. And both of the pot, Stormfront Freaks and Weather Brains have like a segment where you can plug something. Uh. And, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do that. Yeah, we heard that on uh, on yeah, Weather Brains. Weather Brains. We appreciate your kind words, sir. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so so if you you want to check out Weather Hype, it's on iTunes or any other podcast provider, and uh, weatherhypepodcast.com, and you can follow them on Twitter at Weather Hype. So so why why should someone listen to Weather Hype? What do you guys talk about, and what 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 does someone get out of listening to Weather Hype? I think with our podcast, we were trying to do something that was innovative like we wanted to bring the meteorological aspect to it but we wanted to bring it at a level that was kind of interesting maybe someone that is not as knowledgeable in the topic can get involved with it and learn and understand but then we also bring like a humorous aspect to it so that it's just very easily to follow along we want you to feel like you're our friends and you're sitting in a room with your friends and just talking about the weather and that's kind of like the 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 grasp we're trying to get is we yeah. we have like a beginning aspect of it where we kind of talk about the science and social science and how things are communicated in that kind of area 
And then later in the podcast, we move on to like catching up with each other because I mean, we're really good friends. I mean, some would even say best friends. Uh, that's up to men. To say. <laughs> some would. Some would. <laughs> that's up to men. Um, no. <laughs> um, but th- we we don't get to talk a lot, so it's our time to catch up. And so we want you along with us to be right there as well. So how yeah. long have you been doing the podcast? I think our first episode came out in April of last year. So we're yeah. kind of coming up on our one-year anniversary, actually. We are. Get hype. Yeah, right? <laughs> So, yeah, I think um, what Castle you... was saying, like it's um, it's a lot of fun. I I want like both our missions are to make sure that if your mom was listening, or my mom, or my dad, or my grandma, or my best don't, friend, don't talk about listening, my mom, they man. get what's happening. Hey, your mom's cool. <laughs> She's a saint. I'm just <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, like anyone can understand it, and and they don't have to even like weather. They can just be like, oh, that's how it affects me. That's cool. Um, yeah. And then we always throw in like our song of the week thing, what we did, and then Mama Dakota wasn't that like the song yeah. you chose for the one that you're on for us? Yeah, yeah. So the best, the, the best uh, weather hype episode is definitely episode twenty five. <laughs> 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 Dang for man, no, you're no particular reason some, uh... or anything. It's just a really good episode, I think. So <laughs> definitely check that one out. So you guys currently <laughs> both go- live in the same area, right? No, no, actually, um, Castle that in uh, in Georgia, and I'm in North Carolina, so yes. uh, oh, about a six hour okay. drive. So you got your okay, your bachelor's degree at Georgia. Yes, that's yeah, where we met. Yeah, yeah. That's see, both that's where it all began. We um, actually met on eHarmony. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, how did you like? How did you like the school? What University of Georgia? Georgia. Yeah. I mean, I, I am kind of biased, but... Uh, <laughs> Did you hear that uh, there was a game in 1983 called the Sugar Bowl? I feel like I have. Tell me, jog my memory real quick. <laughs> that was when Penn State beat Georgia and won the National Championship. Oh, my God. I had to get that in there. There we go. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> oh, so, like, when uh, Georgia played Penn State in Jacksonville a couple years ago, oh, we beat your butt? I see, I oh, 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 no, 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 I knew that there might be something like that, but I just didn't – I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Clap back, bro. <laughs> I'm um, kidding. Okay. A lot of my friends go to Penn State, so I actually have a, a love for uh, the Nittany Lions. <laughs> So, and my, and my advisor is a Penn Stater. She loves Penn State. Every time I walk into her office, she's always, like, chanting the Penn State stuff. And I'm like, all right, I get it. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. Um, okay, so I'm going to change the subject here, if you don't mind. No, nope, go for it. Uh, I, I have some random questions. Um, so, hopefully, they can be answered here. So, I talk about best. this a lot. I talk about this way too much, but... In Colorado, if there's a snowstorm forecast and we get, let's say, 12 inches more than we expect and forecast for 3 inches and we end up getting 15 inches, there is really no public outcry. No one really cares. Uh, Mm -hmm. The word is mom and there's no big news headline about it. Maybe there's a little chatter, but on the East Coast, if, um, say, in D.C., you get 12 inches or even if you get 5 inches more than was forecast, you're... You have a five-inch forecast, and you get 10. Um, uh, Say the forecast is the day before. Everyone freaks out. It's it's hysteria. People are trying to find someone to blame, and uh, and it's crazy. (laughs) It's crazy. So, uh, what? Why, from like a I don't know a psychology standpoint, why Mm. why does that exist? The legalization of cannabis has allowed the Colorado people (laughs) to be more mellow. No, I'm kidding. Castle, do you actually have real science uh, for your idea? <laughs> um, I'm thinking it has to do something with uh, frequency of seeing these events. Um, I'm sure Colorado sees snow more often, so therefore they're more attuned to it, you could say. But I'm thinking it's like almost like an environmental salience or uh, the people in D.C. may be more attuned to what's going on because they're impacted more. Um, with DC, I know it's not as bad as Atlanta, but like when there is snow on the ground, the traffic gets horrendous. Um, so I think it's more of that 
this is kind of not a happening as often. So when it does happen, it's like more salient and it's really a big deal to those people. That's kind of my best guess. And I feel yeah. like with lifestyles too, maybe like if you're talking about the 12 inch uh, snowfall forecasts that they're off in Colorado, are we talking about like in the front range in the cities or, yeah, or in so rural areas? Yeah, like Boulder, um, Denver. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, not that people in Denver and Boulder aren't doing work, but I feel like in the metropolitan areas on the East Coast, like in even Atlanta or Charlotte, where these things happen, um, it's, I don't know, I guess their, their lifestyle, like they're always like constantly in a rush. Um, they always have to know like what's going on. And then also, um, I haven't actually been in, in Denver when it snowed, I've only been there when it's warm. But for the most part, what I've heard from people is even if it snows a ton, the snow doesn't really stay along very much as it out or the sun melts it away. Is that true? Or do you have something uh, about that? Well, okay. So it can stick around for a while, depending on what time of the year it is. We, we get okay. our big snows in March. So normally the sun is pretty high in the sky and, and it does melt quickly. But if we get a big snow in December or something, it usually sticks around for a while because... Uh, if you're in a pattern where it's just bitterly cold, um, days yeah. on end. But the the one weird thing about out here, I can't speak for every city in Colorado, but I, I've lived in Fort Collins, and that's a big city. It has like over 300,000 people that live there, and they don't plow well, any of the residential roads, only the main roads. So the residential roads stay snow and ice packed for for depending on the snowstorm. It can be like a few days to like two weeks after the snowstorm. Um, and I guess people just get used to driving on it. But how do you drive on unplowed roads? Like, <laughs> how, yeah, you just easy? gotta you just gotta pack it down, I guess. And then when you Snow pack times. it down, it's oh, wow. Snow chains. Yeah, most people have like all weather tires out here. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, I can't even imagine. Yeah, it's yeah, weird. I I was coming from Maryland. I was like, what is this? Why why are the schools still you know in in, <laughs> in class like? Um, with with snow on the road, I I felt like a I don't know I felt like a whiny East Coaster, um, but I I kind of wish East Coast people freaked out a little less and Colorado people freaked out a little more because mm. I feel like there's no real push to like improve the forecast out here because uh. there's no real public outcry. Um, yeah, it's it's weird. Uh, Boulder did this thing. The city of Boulder did this thing where. They now put out their full fleet of plows, no matter how much snow is in the forecast, uh, because last year there was a really big bust, and it really bit them because they were only putting on like half their fleet of plows, and they weren't ready. And so now they just like, if snow's in the forecast, that's all they care about, and then they just put out all of their plows, and it's, you know, no big deal. They, yeah, it's it's weird. Um so to Castle's point about like they're more used to it there and the salience of the situation, if it was like that major flooding event in, in Boulder, for instance, did people mm. have a big outcry over that as opposed to like a snowstorm that might be more common? Yeah, no, definitely. It, that, that the flooding of 2013 um, was, was record breaking for Boulder and Lyons and uh, other parts in between. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, that, that was a big deal. And the forecast, actually wasn't great um uh, the day of they they nailed it down but i think the day before it kind of caught everyone by surprise and uh i don't think they're expecting that much training in that area from all those storms like it just kept coming you know it was crazy yeah yeah no you're right if you look at some of the radar uh reflectivity loops it's it's insane uh oh yeah yeah like 13 to 20 inches in a day or something just yeah just absurd um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna change the subject again. Another random okay. question: um, Do you guys know much about the hazardous simplification project by the National Weather Service? Yes, oh, uh, decent amount. Yeah. Okay, so um, for those of you that don't know, it's uh, basically supposed to simplify <laughs> and make our watch warnings and advisories given by the National Weather Service uh, improve them from a public standpoint, make them a little easier to understand and follow. Um, you guys could maybe talk about why our watch and warning system is. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, I know you're not used to doing the podcast live, so I'll give you yes. a little. Uh... <laughs> Three, two, one. No, just kidding. <laughs> 
So I guess maybe outline what the problems are with the with the watch warning system, and then maybe talk about what we're going to do to improve them. <laughs> sure. Um, so I guess I'll go first, and men can tag team a little later. Um, so one of the big uh, issues, I guess, in quotes that you could start off with is the number of watches, warnings, and advisories that we have. I think it's like 144 or it's, it's a crazy large number. If you, there's a really good image of a table of uh, like a table of watches, warnings, and advisories. So it kind of resembles the periodic table of elements. Um, and you can see all the different colors that are used. Um, so I think one of the big tenets of the hazard simplification project is trying to figure out which watches, warnings, and advisories are key to communicating this information and which ones uh, maybe don't get issued as often or when they do get issued, they're maybe confused for another one. So a good example is the flood product. So there's like a flash flood warning, flash flood watch, there's a flood warning, flood watch, there's an aerial flood, there's like a creek flood, and they're all like slightly a different shade of green. And so I think one of the big things for the hazard simplification project is trying to figure out which flood products are key in communicating flood related information and how can we kind of get that down to two or three products that way maybe one you're not getting so many alerts on your phone so if there's like a a, a warning an aerial flood warning and a, and a flash flood warning but then the next day there's a, just a flood warning you're continuing to get all these alerts on your phone um, so I think that is also one of the things so it's basically trying to figure out how we can take all of the warnings that we have now and get them down to just the key ones that are necessary in communicating the dangers of certain meteorological hazards. Yeah, uh, Council, you put it really well. And uh, an example that we always see come up in comparison to the current watch warning system is a UK Met system where they have, mm -hmm. they have green, yellow, and red. Right, Council? I think that's what it is. Correct, yes. And so the green, yellow, and red represent, I think, the threat level of mm -hmm. how clear the effect will be from the event. And the hazards are like heavy rain, wind, snow yes. is one of them. And so, yeah, they only so they're have, all different icons. Yeah, they're all different icons. They all have a different icon for the different threat. And they use those icons and the colors. And that's all they have. So it seems really simple. Um, is when you try to bring that into the United States, can't really do that as well because we, honestly, we deal with a lot more uh, different types of threats, you know? Um, yeah. So it comes down to, again, like fine tuning what is the most effective way. And the team that's working with Hestem has done a really good job. And, you know, it's like a slow process, but you don't need to be rushing this kind of work because we don't want to be know. messing it up and saying, looking back and being like, wow, we wish we would have in a different way, because this is going to be a big yeah. monumental um, change to how we do things. Um, but there will be phases where they roll out some information, right? I think is what they were thinking about. Correct. Yes. All just come at you in one one sitting. It's going to start being rolled out in the next few years, or you know, whatever. I don't know the specifics of the timeline for everything, but it's going to be a gradual rolling out of the new findings that they have and implementation, not just say you have to deal with a completely new system and we have to educate the public you know that's not how it's going to be and the good thing about this is there is social science practices being yes. put into effect to make this happen it isn't just here let's just come up with some colors and some more throw that on there to people it's actually we're doing our you know time and, and doing uh what we can to actually effectively come up with a good solution and they're using all different types of methodologies, which is like the the best part. So they're using focus groups to figure out like how do emergency managers like the current system? How do meteor meteorologists like it? How do broadcast meteorologists? But then also they're having focus groups of just the general public, d different individuals and how they understand the like the current system. But then as they go through each different round of putting different things out, they have once again, more focus groups, and then eventually they'll move on to surveys and using those surveys to kind of get a more generalizable result with the general public to figure out, oh, so this is how uh, kind of generally the public feels about this system and moving forward with that and using those results in order to keep 
rolling different products out and fine tuning it um, to an, a certain extent. Thanks we for question uh, oh. to everyone that comes on the show. What, were you going to say something? I was just going to say thanks for doing that overview because I'm I'm very very uh, excited to see what the results are of HasSimp. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. All right. Sorry, Tyler. So we like to make it a tradition to ask this question at the conclusion of each episode, and maybe you've heard it on the other episodes, but. <laughs> Uh, what sort of advice would both of you have to those interested in studying meteorology or people currently studying meteorology? Ooh, yeah. Do you want me to go Castle, first? You want to go first? Sure. Um, okay. So I would like to provide advice for people who are specifically trying to integrate social science and meteorology because it is quite a difficult path um, as men and I have both found out and we have taken upon ourselves to make sure that it's not as difficult for people coming after us because once we have carved this path we don't want it to get overgrown again we want it, people to be able to take it a lot easier than we were able to so I think if you go to like the was a students uh, Facebook group you'll find all kinds of different resources that we put together that have mentors people um, and maybe advisors for grad school if you're interested in grad school and most likely social science involves uh, more grad school and figuring out how to use those methodologies to get what you want. So I would advise going and looking at that um, those sheets in order to figure out who would work best with you personally and how you can continue to pursue um, social science and meteorology, but also reaching out to the community, the WASIS community, because they are so helpful and they're always willing to help you. So that would be my advice. And we're, think, we're, we're here to help you too. Just put yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, Castle and I, we're still learning a whole bunch about what social science means in meteorology. We by no time. means have all the answers to anything. Um, and so we definitely don't want to come off like that either. We're all learning and we're all here to help each other. And it's a great uh, networking community that we're building. But um, for those who are studying meteorology right now or who are thinking about doing it, yes, the calculus, the thermodynamics, all that is really <laughs> crazy. <laughs> but if you have a good support network with your friends and your peers and your faculty, you'll get through it. And, and don't be afraid to because that's a common thing where people are really scared about that, the rough, you know, physical aspect or the math aspect of their degree and they can't get through it or they don't think they can. Um, but second of all, you really have to. Uh, try to merge your passions. If your passion is coding mm -hmm. and you want to do computer coding and meteorology, pursue it. My passion is um, creativity and, and meteorology, and, and I've found really cool ways to bridge those together. And it, it takes a lot of effort to do that. You really have to have the initiative on your own and find these opportunities to do it. Um, I think on a podcast a couple of times ago, you guys were talking to Noah, and you guys had mentioned that I was making um, these graphics for the National Weather Service and for FEMA. That's something that's so much fun to do, making preparedness information uh, for social media for the National Weather Service and for FEMA. And it's such a great opportunity to bridge the communication and creativity with getting preparedness information out there to the public. So merging your passions together is a great way to be able to get through it, but also thoroughly enjoy what you're doing. Um, and also take these other non-traditional classes too. Public speaking, mm -hmm. so important. Um, you're going to have to be able to public speak or speak very well when you go into AMS or to conferences to present your research um, and other things too that you need to take um, give you a little bit more perspective about how to bridge meteorology together. Castle and I are both lucky to be in a geography program where we're yes. able to understand the human and social interactions between meteorology a little bit more um, per se than maybe a traditional meteorology program because we're intertwined with the how it affects people <laughs> side of things. And I think that's really awesome. Um, so that's kind of the um, what we read uh, or what I'd recommend or say to people advice wise. Merge your passions. I, I really like yes. that. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, guys. I really appreciate you having on and, and had a really good time. So thank you. Thank yeah, you. thanks for having us, guys. It's been fun. And uh, National Weather Podcast Month is still going it's for another week, I think. But what an awesome, awesome time it's been for the past three weeks for sure. Right? Yeah, it's been great. Uh, been on a lot of podcasts, had people on from a lot of podcasts. Uh, <laughs> couldn't ask for more. Uh, you can follow Min on Twitter at WXMin. 
That's M I N H. And you can follow, follow Castle on Twitter at W X Castle, um, spelled like you think it's spelled. And then you can follow Weather Hype at Weather Hype. And please go check out their podcast. Um, if if you like podcasts, you're gonna like their podcast. Um, and to plug our uh, social media stuff, you can follow us on Twitter at the W X Junkies. We're on Facebook. You can listen to this podcast on iTunes or any podcast provider and give us a rating or review while you're there you'll get a shout out uh, on the show when you do that and you can find everything from the show at the weather tyler who's on next week next week concludes national weather podcast month we have joel gratz the founding meteorologist and ceo of open snow he'll be on the show next thursday at 8 p.m Excited to have him on and talk about how he founded the website and what he's up to nowadays. But for this episode, for Min, Castle, Dakota, and myself, thank you for joining in. We hope you'll join us right back here next week.